All right. So, uh, Pastorology Applied, tonight, Research Edition. Uh, I want to start off um, telling you where we went, which was the International Massage Research Conference in Seattle, May 12th through the 15th. It was awesome. We got actually pretty nice weather, too. And a lot of hills in Seattle. I don't know if anyone's been out there, but there is a lot of hills in downtown. Uh, so I want to start off on kind of explaining what research is. Now, I teach research in the school, and I love it. I get excited. Uh, so I'm going to try to basically force this excitement on you in about five minutes. So this is abbreviated version of my class. So I want to give you this so you can have a kind of an understanding of what we're getting into. So what is research? It's basically a systematic investigation using prescribed methods to discover new facts or revise current theories. And it's like solving a puzzle. So, so research, you, everyone always hears about it in media, like, ooh, this certain new research study shows that chocolate makes you lose weight or drinking a bottle of wine makes you, you know, have antioxidants, all that stuff. So you hear news reports of research, but what we teach the students is actually how to read that research and to actually see if the stuff that they're really saying on TV is really what the research says. So uh, what is typically research looks like? It has the five steps of the scientific method. Uh, as you can see, step one, you got to get a question. Uh, and then step two is developing a hypothesis. So typically you see that in your research articles. Uh, the next part is designing the experiment, collecting data, and drawing a conclusion. So that's what typically almost all research involves that. Uh, so what you normally see in news reports is that drawn conclusion from the collection of data. And so what you normally see is a beautiful research article. That's usually a byproduct of the research method, or scientific method. So this is what a research article typically looks like. Title page, and there's the abstract. Uh, you'll see an introduction, which actually kind of talks about um, the paper trying to give a case for why we're looking into this research. Uh, oh, let me back up what the abstract is. The abstract, when you, if you ever look for research, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit later, um, you're actually going to see like this abstract, which is almost like the trailer of the research paper. It's like, um, you know how you go to the movies and you, you sit and watch the trailers? That's what the abstract is. So it's basically the summary of that paper and kind of a little thing to wet your whistle and get you to want to click on reading that article. So you'll see that first introductions next. Like I said earlier, it's the thing to make the case. It's the section where you make the case for your research study. Uh, methods talks about what the researcher did to get uh, to their results. And the results of the um, paper is in that section, of course, results. Uh, and then next is discussion and conclusion. Sometimes you see this together, but typically it kind of concludes what the paper did, or discussion also includes like things that happened in the paper. And of course, references at the very end actually is quite important. Um, that's a big thing for a lot of research articles is references. So those are the little highlights or the, the notations like where this researcher got their data. Okay, so you'll see different articles out there and you want to make sure they have um, those references there. Okay? All right, and then I want to talk about uh, the hierarchy of evidence. And uh, so a hierarchy of evidence, what, um, sorry, the phone's ringing. <laughs> okay, so typically the hierarchy of evidence, hierarchy of evidence, uh, there's five levels. So I'm not going to get too much into this, but I want you to understand um, the higher up you go in this hierarchy, the less bias you have on research. So a systematic review is the highest that you'll see that tends to have the, less, the least bias. Um, but we are going to talk about case reports. And case reports is what you typically see um, or what we actually are seeing currently right now um, at the um, is what our students are actually doing. We have a school associated with uh, 
our clinic. And so case reports and case series are things that we actually have our students do. So in my class, what I teach the students to do is actually prep for Randy's class, which is case reports in the case, actually, I'm sorry, it's the case report section. So as you can see on this hierarchy, um, it's a little low. It's actually above ex ex expert opinion. Now, I don't want you to think it's less valuable. It's actually very important. And actually, expert opinion is your foundation of, of what this research is. It starts off with your expert opinion. But case reports are very important. And that's where um, now when we go and look at research, um, massage research in particular, they're trying to make everything more patient-based. Um, I, when we went to the, the uh, research conference, one thing that one of the speakers said in my, one of my breakout sessions, she, she basically said, you know, don't think of people as pharmaceutical drugs. Or we're not doing pharmaceuticals. We're doing massage therapy, and this needs to be more patient-based. And so they really emphasized how important these case reports are, making everything really trying to understand what the patient's going through and, and building on that. So the case series is actually a compilation of case reports. So case report is one person. So you, you really go and talk about that one person, and then that one person, um, a case series, goes into several cases of, of uh, it's basically several, several research of one person, and you have several of those together. So that's what a case series is. So again, that's what we do a lot is the case reports. And uh, that's what they really emphasize in the, uh, the conference. Uh, so I'm going to just add something there real quick if I can. Uh -huh. um, so in, in talking to, to the researchers, now the, the people at this conference um, that we're presenting, most of them are PhD researchers um, and that's what they do for a living and they do randomized control trials and systematic reviews and things like that. And what, what one of the doctors was, was talking about when I was talking to him was that Yes, the higher you get on this, the less bias there is. Um, but he also said the further it is from actual what the patient is receiving in the treatment room. It's like the, the lower on this, the, the, the case report is actually much closer to what the, the patient is actually receiving. Um, and now that this, this idea of individualized care uh, is is something that is was kind of a buzz term while we were there, uh, meaning that what they used to do is is put a protocol together, right? Um, all right, so we're going to do this carpal tunnel protocol, and that means you're going to work on the pec minor, and you're going to do three strokes in the cross fiber direction, and you're going to do it for four times, and then we're going to work on the supinator, and then we're going to work on the pronator, and we're going to see if this protocol has any effect on, on carpal tunnel syndrome. But they realize that that's not what takes place when people actually go in for treatment. Um, what takes place is the therapist making you know, judgment calls onto what, maybe I need to do this a little bit longer, maybe they don't need this particular one, but they'll do this one. And they're like, that's what actually is going on. And so that's really more what we want to study at this point, is what, what actually happens when the patient goes in for treatment. And um, that, that is making case reports that much more important in the way that the researchers are looking at this. I just wanted to add that. Oh, Go thank ahead. you. Thank you, Randy. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and actually, we're going to talk about systematic review here in a few minutes um, also. Okay, uh, just two things I want to throw out there that you will hear us maybe mention is qualitative and quantitative research or data. Um, that quantitative is numerical data. It's data that basically makes charts and, and typically it's usually, there's a word called VAS, visual analog scale, that um, they will use to uh, quantify that data. Qualitative research or qualitative data is not numerical. Uh, sometimes it's pictures or words. So ADL, like uh, um, uh, activities of daily living, 
Uh, one thing that kind of going back to those case reports that Randy was saying is they're very interested to know what that patient, if that patient is benefiting um, from the massage and how it's impacting their life. So that is something you may see is this qualitative data. Um, okay, so quick poll. Uh, how do you think uh, research can actually benefit your practice? So I'm going to launch this little poll um, out there to you. And, yeah, you go me. Oh, I'm doing it. I'm launching. I'm launching. So it's going to say, this is like my first poll launch, man. All right. So we're going to see is how can research best benefit your practice. So in other words, if you don't, if you've never experienced research, I want you to kind of just think, well, how could I, or how could it? So let's see how good of a lecture I am from my few slides. <laughs> so I just put the oh. poll and go ahead. You guys start clicking. Do you guys see it? You should okay. have what five different possible five answers. Five possible just answers. That. So, so what do we have here? We have improved communication credibility with healthcare workers, um, improved communication with your clients, uh, drive new business to your practice, maybe, maybe get new people in your door, uh, increase effectiveness in your current techniques, like what you're doing now, um, to to refine it and make it better. Um, or you can increase confidence of effectiveness of cur oh, that's current treatment. Um, effectiveness in treatment techniques, I guess, is the new ones then. We'll say that's new treatment techniques. Um, the confidence in the ones you're already doing is the last one. Oh, this is pretty cool. Do you see that little thing on the side? I do. Yeah, we can see it all like shifting. Oh, we need some pole music. <laughs> do, 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 Jeopardy? Do. Yeah, Jeopardy music? Maybe they're they're all wait wait why are people leaving? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay, so seventy seven percent of you have cast a vote. Oh, eighty percent. Oh wait, no, they keep going. It's like watching uh, like a little race. It's like <laughs> all right, we're gonna give you thirty more seconds. Come on. Come on, click right, faster. More Ten more seconds. Ten more seconds. All right. Here we go. And do I close the poll? And you, there's a button that says close poll. There's also a button that says manage. No, I did close. Close. All right, we close the polls. All Hold right. Eighty-seven percent voted. Wow. Share it. Are you going to share the results? Did I push the manage button? Let's see. No, the where it said close poll, it says share results. Oh, I I hope I I just. I just exploded this computer. Uh, oops. Okay. Okay, here we go. Share it. There it is. Can you see it? Yes. Um, Can everybody else see it? Can we see the poll? Um, oh, it looks like let me Wait. go back to my question panel. Hide poll results able. Okay. So no, I can see it. I, I see it on the right, but I don't see it on the. Okay. Well, anyway, so what do we got? 35% said improved communication and credibility. Uh, Healthcare workers. Uh huh. And it looks like the most, the biggest one got 50% of effectiveness and treatment techniques, increased effectiveness. So actually learn new stuff is what that is. Ah, that's nice. Wow. They, people like to learn on this webinar. Look at that. They do. Well, they're showing up for the webinar. So that, that usually means they like to like to do that. Uh, let me go to the. Oh, thank you, Deb. Wait, okay. I got your it's on the screen. Deb says it's on her screen, so oh, we're good. Okay. Uh, so good. So so that seems to be uh, you know where people feel like they it can help them. Um. Oh, I lost your screen, Ramona. Oh, hold on. Can you see it now? Is my screen? Yeah, oh, I see our pictures. I see our pictures. Oh, hold on. Show my screen. My little computer's doing There we go. Is okay, we're back. back. Whew, okay. All right. Can you see this right. right now? Okay. So, can you see my next screen? Evidence-based practice? Not yet. I just see poll. How can research best benefit your practice? Let me try this one. How about that? Yes. Boom. There we go. 
this this PC is not going to stop me. All right. So what we're talking about, about research and putting it in your practice, it's called an evidence-based practice. So let me tell you, it's evidence-based, so that means you have evidence backing up what you're doing. Um, so this is what pretty much what they're – what an evidence-based practice is looking for is um, you make these decisions for your patient, right? You're going to try to figure out, okay, you know, what's the best avenue to go for? And uh, so this is how you get to that conclusion. You, you find the best available evidence, which is research, and then you take your clinical experience and your, your client's needs and preferences. And so with all that combined, you have this decision-making. So um, so we do this posturology chart, and we actually, with with our our sessions, chart every session, and we are trying to track the patient's progress. And so, what we do currently right now at the clinic is we do a type of uh, evaluation every time and 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 charting, and that is part of our decision making. We take a good patient history that's part of our decision making. And now we actually incorporate what a lot of um, doctors and MI reports and things like that to make part of the decision making we do at our clinic. But now we actually started employing this research. And part of our program at the school is they actually have to complete a research case report. And so um, I will tell you from personal experience, I started doing this, completely changed me as a practitioner. When I started teaching it, again, completely changed everything. It's amazing when you start really looking at research. So why do I care? I just told you all this wonderful things about research. I'm totally excited, kind of went through it pretty quick. So here's a question. Why do you care? Why, why would I care to put research or even read it? Um, and so this is what I always tell my students is it empowers you as a practitioner. Um, I became a type of person that doesn't really, um, I don't buy into things right away. You know, I always sit there and say, okay, I got to do some research. Um, the, the credibility it helps to build. So what happens is when you read research and you feel confident in what you're so knowing and you're saying, and then you educate others, it actually helps to build that credibility. So people actually um, trust you more. Um, they have more confidence in what you're saying. It actually improves a lot of communications with other practitioners, doctors, massage therapists, chiropractors. Um, and I put that little money sign because it improves your practice, which improves your clientele base, which more patients come in. So yes, there is a monetary benefit on improving as a therapist, you know, doing it with research. So these are why you want to start looking at research. It actually, I think for me, the biggest part is empowerment for the practitioner. You really feel supported in what you're doing. Um, and so, again, I get to teach this stuff. I get to see the students really change through research, especially this case um, during um, student clinic. I get to watch students go from, oh, I'm working on people like timid, and then you get you have them go through the case report process, and then they just change completely as a, a therapist in student in the student clinic. So it, I get the privilege to see that. It's very exciting. And, and Randy does as well. He actually is the one that does all the heavy lifting in the uh, case report. So, um, okay, so I want to talk about what, or actually Randy's going to go in and talk about what he, uh, the research that was at the conference. Uh, so Randy, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Um, are you just going to be my Vanna here for me? I will Vanna white it for you. I appreciate it. Okay, so most exciting thing at the conference that we found um, was this very recent um, study. Uh, this thing just came out, you can see May 10th um, of 2016. It was published in Pain, what's it called, Pain something? Wait, where was it published? <laughs> uh, drawing a blank. 
Do you remember everyone was the name of the journal? Oh, uh, yes, it's the uh, uh, pain medicine pain medicine pain. journal. Yeah, pain medicine journals. And okay. it was the it's published in, in pain medicine. Um, it is the very first uh, meta analysis. You'll see the term meta analysis up there. Um, so it's a systematic review and meta analysis of randomized control trials of patients experiencing pain in the general population <clears throat> and the effect of massage therapy. So remember that that uh, pyramid, right? If you go back to the pyramid here real quick, uh, Ramona. Oh, getting there, getting there. <clears throat> it's Thank coming. You. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, you'll see right at the top, systematic reviews. And right below that are randomized controlled trials. So randomized controlled trials are exactly what they sound like. They're randomized, um, they're controlled, and they're trials. And <clears> the <throat> systematic review is a compilation of a bunch of randomized controlled trials um, and, and figuring out what if you compile them all together, what does the data show you? So all right, back to our trial, back to our systematic review. OK. so. To do this, they had to compile lots and lots and lots of data, right? They had to bring in, basically, they, they took all of the research that had been done on massage therapy uh, related to pain. And if you go to the next slide here, um, here we go. They did a search, and they did it on all the different research databases. Um, and this is the search they did. Uh, as you can see, they included a lot of different things. Um, Pain, massage, right? Neuromuscular therapy, strain, counter strain, Traeger, purpose of neuromuscular stabilization, right? Manual lymph drainage, vibration, to, yeah, all sorts of stuff, right? Anything that kind of falls under that umbrella of massage, and so they they did that search and they they searched all the the Cochrane database and the PubMed and all the different places that you can find research, and what they found. Next chart, next slide. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Oh. oh. Is there any way to, I can see that whole picture? Uh, hold on. It's. Oh, no. What? No, there isn't. Okay. Um, I'll try to do the best I can with what I got. Okay, so. <laughs> We missed a whole piece up here, but they found, uh, let's just say, 3,678 um, of those. They went through them, and they screened for the inclusion criteria, which is because they got a lot of stuff, right? Some of their inclusion criteria were things like it had to be done by a massage therapist, right? Because there's a lot of re massage research that, like, a nurse is doing the, the massage, or someone who's not trained in massage therapy. Um, it had to be a randomized control trial. It had to be, right, they, they went through it, it, their inclusion criteria, and that excluded most of them. You'll see, of the 3,678, only 142 made it through that, that criteria. Um, of the, then they, they actually read, so they, they could just do from the abstract. They, they got rid of all of those. Then they read the whole article. Um, and if there were problems with the research, it wasn't done properly, it wasn't done in the right setting, it wasn't right, they had to exclude some. So they had to exclude 43 more. They got 99 articles. Um, oh. Oh, uh, it's blown up over here. Sorry. Hold on. I love webinars. They always work perfectly for me. There we go. There we go. Uh, 99 articles. Um, met all of that criteria, um, then you can see it broken down. There were, uh, 16 of them were cancer, 16 of them were surgery related, and 67 were everything else. Um, now that kind of is, I mean, it's good and bad. That means we've done 99 articles. We've done less than a 100 really good studies on massage and pain, um, which is not very many. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, but that's kind of our field is still in that that infant stage, um, and and so this, but this is the first time they've had enough of them 
um, that they could actually do this systematic review. That, were, that, that was in, considered enough to do a systematic review. Um, the, the systematic review then um, started to look at, at individual subjects. So I'll show you a little graph here next. Uh, let's see if I can see that graph. There we go. Um, so just to explain that little chart real fast, you'll see there's negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Um, on that little, little graph, and you'll see there at the bottom there's a diamond-looking thing. Um, basically, if that diamond is not touching the zero line, and it's in the negative side, that means that massage is indicated for that condition, like it, it helps, okay? Um, that whatever you're studying helps. If it's touching the zero line, it's kind of neutral, and if it's on the right side of the the zero line, that means massage is not indicated for that particular condition. So that gives you just a, a general layout. Um, and you'll see they, they, here's some of the studies they chose to look at this. Um, and this was massage versus doing no treatment at all, right? And this is for pain. Um, this is for musculoskeletal pain. You'll see it, it highly favors massage. Um, it highly favors massage versus no treatment which we would all expect, great. So what if we give them a fake treatment, like a sham treatment, right? Um, so that would be the next slide. You see that was 219 people in that group. This is 290 people in this group in which they were given a sham treatment. Now, a sham treatment, it, that's one of the problems with studying massage, right? Is that sham treatments are hard to come by. How do you fake a massage? Um, it's not easy to do, is it? Uh, so the, some of these things were like uh, fake ultrasound, um, in which they had an ultrasound machine that just was, all the lights and everything were running, but it just wasn't connected to the actual ultrasound, so the person was getting a fake treatment. Um, they had things what they considered light touch. Basically, they just kind of laid hands on people and talked to them. Um, they did some with uh, just music playing, like relaxation stuff to compare it to, um, and, and use that as a, as a sham treatment. Um, and you see, even with the sham treatment, you're still on the proper side of the zero line, uh, meaning that, again, massage is indicated as it actually makes a difference. Uh, when you when you test these people, and this is all for musculoskeletal pain, so this is a big deal. This is why is this such a big deal? Um, because this is the kind of stuff that insurance companies look at um, to see if they're going to start to pay for stuff, uh, which is a big deal for us. Um, is that if if you actually are you have real evidence showing that your treatment is effective, is a big deal. Um, so, so that's that's a big thing. So, what else did they do? They compared it to what what they call um, what, active control. So, so let's see the next one here. There we go. Results of massage versus active comparators um, again for musculoskeletal pain, and you can see how many different things they did um, over here to compare them to, right? Um, standard treatment, conventional treatment, progressive muscle relaxation, mental relaxation, relaxation, there, stretch, self-stretching, passive stretching, remedial exercise and posture, acupuncture, acupuncture, transcutaneous, all right, you can see all the stuff over on the study name area, kind of what they were comparing it to and how it compared. And overall, when you compare all of the evidence and what it's compared to, it's still in the right side of that zero line, just about to touch that zero line, but still, so that's weakly favored, um, that massage is actually favored over most treatments, which is, again, really, really positive for us, um, a, a, a big deal here. Uh, so, so you'll see the number here, 1,349 subjects. Up in the title there, you'll see that. Um, so this became a pretty large sample size that we were looking at. Um, and the larger the sample size, 
the closer you're going to get to zero most of the time anyway. So there's a reason why that's a little bit closer. Uh, so if you go to the next one, what you'll see is this was another active comparator, but this was not no longer musculoskeletal pain, but this is anxiety. Um, they also looked at massage for anxiety instead of musculoskeletal pain and found that, again, even compared to these other things that have been cut off, so you can't really see all of them, but physical therapy, relaxation, um, looked like there was a breathing one there. Um, it's kind of hard to see where that thing got cut off. But, um, but yeah, so you'll see over there that – actually, I might have that slide. Let me see if I can find it. Um, do you want me to, you know what, I think I could switch over presenter to you. Uh, let me see, because I'm gonna, that might work. let me do that. And uh, I will have to just make it bigger on my screen. Here we go. You have the helm, Captain. Can you see mine? Did it work? I don't know. Did I just change it? Oh, it won't let me give it to myself. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm Randy Clark. Sure. Yes. Okay. So let me get off of this thing here. Um, so I'm going back to that. Where'd it go? I want to tell you what it actually compared to. Uh, oh. Oh, mine just got messed up too. Okay. So we're just breaking. So yeah, there are, there are a bunch of different things that it was compared to. Um, yeah, it's weird. So. But again, massage favored in all of these different things. So this was a very positive, I mean, this, this study took lots and lots of money to do. Um, and it was funded by the Massage Therapy Foundation and the American Massage Therapy Association. Um, but it was all independent researchers that had done this. They, they hired this, the Samueli Institute, which is a very respected uh, research institute to do this, this meta-analysis. Um, and, and got some very favorable stuff. So go one more slide for me. There it is. So the conclusion, what they came up with, what, this is the, the guidelines from the Samueli Institute um, that says massage therapy may be beneficial for improving various patient-reported functional outcomes for populations experiencing pain. That's a big statement. Um, there's clear evidence supporting the efficacy of massage therapy compared to no treatment for pain intensity, suggesting that massage therapy rather than no treatment at all should be offered to a patient for pain management. Um, compared to sham or active comparatives, massage therapy is beneficial across various functional outcomes, including anxiety and health-related quality of living. That's H-R-Q-O-L. Um, However, further work needs to be better to promote massage therapy for pain populations, specifically future research should consider this review's definition of massage therapy is moving forward. So that's a big line, right? Because one of the big problems the researchers had is that the definition of massage therapy is difficult. <laughs> what do you include? What do you not include in massage therapy? Um, and so they had a hard time, and, and there was no clear, they had to come up with their own definition. Um, of massage therapy moving forward uh, so that they could actually see uh, like what's going on. That we, the field itself, they're basically saying the field itself doesn't have a clear view of what it is, um, which I think we all kind of get to see. Um, hey, so, Randy. But this is a big deal. Um, Sam, Sam Welly put out a very positive uh, statement about massage. So that should change everything overnight, right? Yes. <laughs> you should be chuckling slightly. <laughs> um, the, the, no, it doesn't. It, but this is the, the first big step. This is the first time any of this has happened. Um, the, the positive news is we have really good evidence. The, there was a, a doctor there who was one of the keynote speakers who um, said, this is all wonderful and great, and he was really happy about this. And then he said, so when a drug gets this kind of thing, and, and he said, because he was comparing massage to uh, opioids, 
and saying that, that the report the massage got was just as good as opioids. It got the same report as opioids without all the side effects, which is a big deal, right? Really big deal. He said, so this kind of report, for it to get to market and, and basically become part of standard care, usually takes, said, about 16 years and $800 million, <laughs> which was a little overwhelming. Um, but he said that the massage does have some benefits in that it's been around so long and can probably do it in a shorter period of time. Um, but, but things like the definition of massage needs to be looked at. Um, and, and we are all part of that. Um, it is, we all do different things and call them massage. And, and we have to start using a common language to really study what it is that we're doing. Um, so that was something that, that the group talked about. But so this was just one of the big papers um, was this big uh, pain meta-analysis. Um, another, so another keynote speaker, there were three keynote speakers. Um, another keynote speaker was from the Mayo Clinic. And so let's look at the Mayo Clinic work here in just a second. Um, Mayo Clinic has been studying massage since 2005. Um, in in its in its clinics, and it has some very large clinics, and and is in, important to them to provide the best care that is possible. You probably have all heard of the Mayo Clinic, um, and and patient outcomes and patient satisfaction is is a big deal to them, um, and they have a whole integrative medicine department um, at the Mayo Clinic um, in which they hire people like massage therapists to do research, um, and. These, uh, this CV, right, that's uh, the cardiovascular surgery patients. And you saw there was a pilot study done in 2005, um, which they got really good results. So they got to a bigger study, got even better results. And then the colorectal people said, hey, if your guys are getting such good results, then we want to try it in our department. And they tried it in their department. The thoracic surgery people jumped on board. The cardiology people jumped on board. The breast surgery people and breast reconstruction people have now jumped on board. Um, this thing is spreading. It's spreading through their hospital. It's now on all the floors of the hospital. Um, and, and you can see, basically at the end of this, all studies with similar conclusions. Um, it improves the patient experience, um, symptom management, and interest in services um, across the board. That patients liked it. They got better, faster in doing this. So, so Mayo, which is a big money thing, is putting money and time into researching this and trying to figure out how it uh, helps these people while they're in the hospital. Uh, so um, if you look at the next one, oh, did we miss the timeline? I guess there was no timeline. Um, it somehow got. Somehow got. Erased. Okay. Um, so don't worry about the timeline. Um, I, I will talk to you just real quickly about, um, this is a current study, we're just going to fly through this really fast, but just to show you kind of what they're doing right now, they're doing a breast, they, they wanted, to, they found out that massage therapy works for these breast reconstructions and all of this stuff and really helps to manage their pain. Um, they wanted to do massage therapy now with meditation to see if that enhanced it. Um, and so you can just, that's, they have two groups, go ahead and next slide. Uh, here's the basic thing that they did um, when they were doing the reconstruction. They basically took a flap from the abdomen and used that flap to rebuild the breast is what they ended up doing. Um, and you can see they had to reattach the artery and the vein and all that stuff. Um, so that because it's real living tissue, they're replacing it with real living tissue so it has to stay alive, so it needs blood and all that stuff. Um, here's kind of what they did, private hospital room. Um, Post-operative days one, two, and three. They only did for three days. Uh, so not a whole lot. Um, they, they use some essential oils and pressure and all that stuff. Uh, so next one. So massage provided favorable effects in patients recovering from reconstructive surgery following mastectomy and breast cancer. So, so again, it, it did really well. The meditation didn't seem to help at all. Um, the, the results were, it, I mean, when you looked at the graphs, almost exactly identical 
whether you got the massage or you got the massage and the meditation. Um, so it basically said either it wasn't long enough or we didn't do it right, but meditation didn't seem to help along with the massage. Oh, um, ready? I think what they, yeah. what they said is the patients weren't compliant with the meditation. They didn't get into the habit, well, I think is well, what she said. Right, because they tried to do it at home after. Right. right? They had three days in the, in the hospital, and then they were supposed to do the meditation afterwards. Um, and they didn't, but but the meditation in the hospital because they didn't they tracked that too. It didn't seem to help in the hospital either. Um, so so that was just one of the current ones that they are doing. Um, just to kind of give you another another brief exposure of there was another group there, and and <clears throat> this was the military. Um, the the military is doing its own massage research, uh, which I found to be um, interesting. Um, and a guy named Tripp, he was, he was a really cool speaker. Um, he's an MD and, and like a lieutenant or something. I don't know who he was. But, but he, he gave a talk, and so did uh, Allison Mitchinson, who did this study. Uh, and, and you'll see acute postoperative pain management using massage as an adjuvant therapy, and what it came up with is massage is an effective and safe adjuvant for relief of acute post-operative pain in patients undergoing major operations. So they're finding the same thing that the Mayo Clinic is finding, is that, that right after surgery is a great time for massage. Um, what you saw here is a decrease in pain intensity, um, pain unpleasantness, anxiety, um, in, in all of, in basically in the groups across the board with really low p-values, which is great, um, is that the it, it's working, um, and this was what um, massage, a twenty-minute massage, um, up to five days post-operative, is, is what they did. That was it, um, and and they get all of these positive results. So we're starting to get some evidence here um, from the government. You can see the next slide. I think is her actually giving the massage. There she is, um, doing doing massages in hospital beds po poses its own problems especially when you have lines and IVs and monitors and all that stuff hooked up to the person. Um, talked about some of the issues uh, with that uh, and the railings getting in the way and, and all of that stuff. Um, other stuff that the VA has already done, um, palliative care and veterans with advanced illness. Um, so what is palliative care, right? We don't expect them to get better. We just expect them to feel better is what this is. Um, and so reducing suffering in palliative care patients. A lot of palliative care patients are patients that are terminal. They might be hospice patients. Um, they might just have something that they know can't really be, isn't going to change. Um, uh, but they found that even those people with those advanced illnesses um, responded really well. Uh, pain intensity, anxiety, uh, sense of relaxation, inner peace, all of that stuff all was helped by massage. Um, for those of you who, I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a quick question here. Um, on the right of your screen where you have your little thing, is there a thing that says handouts? Uh, raise your hand if you see something that says handouts over on the right of your screen somewhere. Oh, uh, yep, they got it. Are we seeing hands? I am seeing hands. Well, I, I see three. See oh, four, five. If you, do you know how to raise your hand? There if you, you okay, do not so raise your hand, raise your hand. So, <laughs> if you do not raise your hand, raise your hand. Um, the, there should be something that says resource links over there. Um, that is for you guys to download. Just click on that. You can have it. Uh, everything I'm talking about here, are there are links on that Word document to everything we've talked about so that you don't have to try to look all this stuff up yourself. Um, you can just go ahead and, and download that and you get all of these things that I'm talking about. You can look at them closer. Um, so, so this is another thing. And then there's one they're currently, they just finished, and I think that's the next slide. Uh, Perceptions. They want to know 
they never really asked the patients if they liked it. <laughs> Basically is what it is. They're like, we've studied this, but we've never really looked to see if people want it. <laughs> um, and again, as you would expect, very favorable. Very favorable. The patients all really liked having it and wanted it and thought it was really helped their care and all of that stuff. Which it's funny that, that they just never really asked that. <laughs> I, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, all right. So Ooh, another, another great poll. poll. This is really fast. This is a true false poll. So or a yes no poll. Um, are you gonna launch that one now? I am Mark? gonna launch. So it's yes or no. Have have you just described? Subscribed. Subscribed, not described. Subscribe to the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. So if you have, say yes or no. Well, if you have, say yes. If you haven't, say no. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> All right. We're going to do... right, I Oh, I think it's after. 69% voted. Come on, come on. One more person. Just so come you can on, get 70%. One more. Come on, vote America. Vote. Come on. Rock the vote. We won't judge you, I you promise. You and died so that you could vote. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not in this poll, but still. All right, 75%. I like that. That's good. All, All right, right, go ahead and close that. All right, closing the poll. And Sharon. There we go. So, 81% of you have not, which is, we kind of expected that. I'm actually kind of surprised that 19% of you had. Um, if you have not, I think there's a link in our resource links. It is free. It is a free thing. This is a peer-reviewed journal um, that is put out by the Massage Therapy Foundation. It is indexed on PubMed. It is a real journal. Um, it is where you're going to find a lot of the, the stuff. It is also a free, meaning free, resource. That means you get the whole paper. You don't just get the abstract. You get everything for free. It's all supported by the Massage Therapy Foundation and the AMTA. Um, and, and this is not most, you don't find this everywhere. This is actually a really cool thing. Um, it's put out quarterly. Uh, and they uh, basically, if you subscribe, it's just email. They're not going to send you anything. The, when they, they launch it, they'll just send you a, a notice that, hey, the new one's out. And then you can just a link to go to it, and you get all the new research as it comes out. Um, it, definitely, if you're going to have an evidence-informed practice, it's something that I would consider doing. Um, because it takes probably a good 30 seconds to a minute to, to do, and you get all current stuff when it comes out and keeps you on top of your game, um, which we definitely would recommend. Uh, all right, back to our presentation. So next question, where is the massage therapy industry headed? So, um, Northeast. And West. No, the, so this is the biggest takeaway we got, Randy and I. Um, so I can't see your screen yet, Ramona. No, oh, you can't see my screen? You know why? Because I gave you... Can you hit results? Can you hit hide results? Oh, <laughs> darn it. I had a really awesome slide, see? Had like a little yes. compass, a little question mark. Where's massage therapy headed? All right. So so this is our biggest takeaway we got. Um, we saw hospitals, private insurance, doctor's office, case reports, and research. Down below is probably the nicest man I have ever met great presenter. That is Brent Dra Jackson. Brent, yes. Brent, Brent Jackson. Brent Jackson. He, uh, actually, Randy, you know more about him. He's he's a massage. Yeah, no, yeah he's a massage teacher, but he has a yep. program in a hospital. In which so, hospital? yeah, he, he's based in, uh, what, is it South Carolina? I think it's South Carolina. South Carolina, yes. Um, and they have uh, schools. They have the, the He's in a school uh, system that teaches massage therapy in South Carolina, and they have a hospital-based massage program. Um, and now they have, I think, seven hospitals. Yes. Um, in which they do rotations with their students into those hospitals. Um, of the seven hospitals that, that he started in, five of them have already hired full-time massage therapists to come work at the hospital and 
from all the results the students were getting with their uh, with their patients that they decided that their patients need this and they've hired massage therapists to work at the hospital now. Right. Um, and, and so he's opening up some doors through his students um, to get into this this stuff and and it's really starting I mean it's really starting to take hold in in that area um, and starting to pr produce some really great results and that's with just a, a massage therapy program massage therapy students right um, uh, this is we could really do even more um, with a little better training so so he's been working at this um, and and doing some really really cool stuff getting it in there um, again, all of this is leading towards things like private insurance coverage um, uh, and, and helping our, our field to move forward here um, is that as you get more of this medical evidence, it becomes easier and easier to uh, get this out there and, and open up doors to patients that maybe you didn't, didn't think massage was an option before. Um, you bring a meta-analysis to a, a physician, and they will take a look at it. Um, you know, that's that's you're speaking their language now, um, and go, hey, look, I really think I can help. And and one of the things they talked about, especially the the military people, talked about the problems with opioid abuse, and that it's a really hot topic right now. Um, that the, the the stat they had said was. The U.S. accounts for 5% of the population and 80% of the opioid use in the world. Um, and, and said that this is a problem. Um, and especially in the military, opioid addiction and abuse is a big, big deal. Uh, and so if you can provide a similar amount of relief to a chronic pain sufferer, uh, because basically, I mean, the doctors were there saying, hey, look, we do a phenomenal job of trauma care, right? It's like, don't send me into a battlefield without morphine. <laughs> I need morphine to do my job on the battlefield. But that same morphine, when I get back and they're in a chronic state, we do a really, really bad job of taking care of our soldiers. Um, and and so he said something, he said, we are by far the number one spender on health care um, per capita. So more than double number two. Um, it, it is ridiculous how much we spend on health care. And in chronic pain care and chronic condition care, we rank 39th amongst, amongst, amongst countries in how we take care of those people. It's like we're doing something wrong. Um, 39th puts some countries that probably aren't first world countries ahead of us. Um, it's, it's really bad. Uh, so, so looking into these integrative medicine pieces, and, and that's something else he said. There, there, were, there were some talks. Um, it was very clear. He's like, stop calling yourselves alternative care. It's like, it just puts you in a you, you're not an alternative. You are healthcare, right? You're not an alternative to healthcare. You are healthcare, and and that's why they've they've even changed. It used to be the CAM division at NIH, which is the Complementary and Alternative Medicine. It is now the Integrated Medicine Division. Um, alternative just puts you outside the system, and that he's like, you don't want that. He's like, you, they they immediately shut you off if you're alternative. Uh, you are integrative. Um, and he said the other thing, and this was just somebody getting on their soapbox, if you want to be accepted by doctors and and want to start to work with them, with patients, it's like, stop going and bad-mouthing doctors on Facebook. <laughs> it's like, that doesn't help you get in the door or, or get the camel's nose under the tent, as he would say. <laughs> um, that, that there's a whole thing about the camel's nose under the tent. But that's just an ongoing joke there. Um, that 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 is not going to help. He's like, represent yourselves professionally, and you will be taken as professionals. Um, 
and and that was one of the things that the things that he wanted us to he was kind of preaching like hey we want you in but you keep saying terrible things about us <laughs> and so we're not going to let you in um, like that that's not the way to get your foot in the door uh, so um, so yeah so that was just some of the stuff I don't know what else you have here Ramona um, the most important website ever oh, yeah. This is you want to talk about this? Yes, the Massage Therapy Foundation. This is this website. Um, I love it. So where it says uh, grants and contests, they actually have a contest where you can submit your case reports. So um, yes, you can write a case report. You can take a patient that you have and actually do uh, a research article on them. Now. Next question, you're like, how do I do that? This website has so many resources on how to do that. Um, if you go to the education part on this little, excuse me, this tab here, and then you click on students and educators, they have a five-part webinar that goes into how to write a case report. They have all these resources on there. Um, it's wonderful. I actually take most to all my curriculum with these what off of this website um, currently I'm in meet kind of correspondence back and forth with this foundation uh, because I do want to offer this to our seminar students uh, so I actually have been compiling and building curriculum and contacted them and say can I have your blessing to use your your content and they are totally excited about it because they want more people doing research um, they want more people submitting these these research to case reports uh, or these uh, case reports to the contest. One thing I believe Nikki Monk was saying, I think it was like only 35 massage therapists last year submitted uh, case reports to the IJTMB. I think it was, I believe, was that right, Randy? Because she said only 35 uh people did that yeah I think that was right yeah that was right yeah and so um, totally just you know the need is out there and I guess tell people it's like you really change a lot as a therapist once you write, write that case report you know so this is a fantastic site um, even under resources all the links there's a lot of links to PubMed links to um, uh, the IJTMB, so they have a bunch of links to help you f do uh, a lit review, which is uh, looking for the research when you get into your introduction. So they go go into all of that, and they're they're the ones that hosted the conference and got all the speakers in. So great great group of people, uh, and. So here's a slide, so you'll see uh, this is a student and practitioner case report. The student case report is what we submit our students to at the Center for Neurosomatic Study. And of course, there's a practitioner case report. Um, and here is our website at the school. As you can see, there is, and that's actually on the handout. Um, and I think some of you haven't gotten the handout. If you haven't gotten the handout, when you got the uh, invite, from posturologyapplied at gmail.com. Email me and tell me you didn't get the handout and I will send that to you. So some of you did, some of you didn't. So I want to make sure everyone gets that little handout that has the links because um, it does link it to the case reports that you can see our students submitted. Uh, again, full, full content's there, the full article's there. Um, we'd love for you to read it. Um, and Here's us, Neurosomatic Educators, and there's Randy. Uh, this is our site. You can check our webinars. Now, I will tell you, to be certified in this um, work that we do to be a um, Neurosomatic Therapist, a case report is required. We do ask for you to do that. So um, all of the requirements and things like that, Massage Therapy Foundation has those. Um, again, we're, we're in the process of developing a whole seminar to help people do that, to help people submit or write a case report. So, um, I know, I just wanted to add this real quick, um, it, jumping the gun for a lot of you people out there, but you mentioned Nikki Monk, yes, um, and she is a PhD researcher at Indiana University, and 
they have a program basically to get your PhD in massage therapy. Um, it's not called massage therapy, it's allied health with manual manipulation or something like that. But it's massage therapy. Um, it's one of the only programs in the country to get your PhD in massage therapy. And um, she said, if you have somebody really interested, we, we pay for them to go through the program. Um, she's like, they, they basically, we pay your tuition and give you a stipend to get your PhD. Um, so if, if you got into research and you really liked it and it's something you wanted to do, there is a way to become a doctor of this uh, and, and really get out there and, and you know, make a living out of doing the research. Uh, which is, I mean, I know that's not for everybody. Most of you are therapists, and, and you're good at it, and that's what you want to do. But if there, if you knew somebody, or just the fact that there is a program now where you can do that is super exciting. Um, so that that again was something I learned. I didn't even know that program was out there. So oh that yeah. Was, Wait, that do was you remember cool. they were saying that there's actually a bachelor's program too? There. So the yeah, the, the we were. That's confusing, and I, but there is, um, and I want to say it's through uh, Sandy. NCB TMB or I don't remember. They said Sandy or some Sandy. But it, it's kind of it's not a real bachelor's. Oh, the pretend one. And I'll well, it's I'll, there. There's a difference, and and I'll, that's not a big deal. Um, but no, there there are other ways to do this. So. And, and people are working on programs to, to really set this up to become part of of the academic kind of universe. Yeah, they already started uh, that. And, um, what, important for us to be able to, to I mean, that's, we're, we're basically going through the same thing that physical therapy and chiropractic and all that went through at one point. Um, and, and it's an exciting time. We're, it's really a very exciting time to be a massage therapist. And, and I was... I was inspired by the conference. Yeah, they had uh, someone from New Zealand that uh, they developed a bachelor's program. Yep. Yeah, so that was really. Yeah, and it's and it's working very well in New Zealand. Yeah. So, so there there are there are places that are kind of setting models for us and stuff like that, and that's really cool. So, but I know we're running out of time. So so thank you all for listening. Um, certainly, if you did not get a question answered. Um, or anything like that, go ahead and uh, give us a email or something like that, and we will gladly answer your questions. Um, and, and like Ramona said, if you didn't get the handout, uh, certainly uh, we'd like for you to, to get that. So you have all the blow it up, blow it up. Yeah, all the emails go to my phone. So, so like, please don't email me at 3 in the morning. Or no, actually, please do. Because I don't hear it. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> if I respond, awesome. don't be surprised. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. June 13th uh, is our next webinar. If you guys subscribe to our little... For those of you who are subscribed to the webinars. But thank you so then. much for listening. And... Uh,